We are taking a break from the book of Acts and doing a short thematic series called The Atonement. The Atonement is the study of how God in Christ reconciled himself to us. And therefore the cross, the cross is central to our faith and fundamental to all that we believe about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is one thing to appreciate all the suffering of Christ, all that he endured, but it's imperative, particularly in our day and in our time, to examine from the Word of God the, the reasons, the understanding, the interpretation of why he suffered and why he went to the cross and what took place there on that hill at Calvary. R.C. Sproul, a pastor and author and great Bible teacher, said like this, If it is true that the cross is of central importance to biblical Christianity, it seems that it is essential for Christians to have some understanding of its meaning in biblical terms. That would be true in any generation, he writes, but it's particularly necessary in this one. He says, I doubt there has been a period in 2,000 years of Christian history when the significance, the centrality, and even necessity of the cross have been more controversial than now. End quote. I believe that to be true today. And one of the reasons why it's true when we talk about the atonement is this particular aspect of the atonement that we will be studying today. Our study today is the expiation, big words, we'll explain them, and propitiation work of Christ. I know they're somewhat archaic words, but there's really no other better word to use than that in which we have, and that's the expiation and the propitiation. We'll, we'll, we'll work that out. And and let me just say this, I'm really going to need you, it's kind of late to say this, I should have told you yesterday, to track with me, maybe some extra coffee this morning, but I'm really going to need you to track with me, I'm really going to need you to to think with me, because when we talk about the propitiation of God in Christ, by and large it has to do with the wrath of God, okay, it's going to have to do with the wrath of God. I know that you were on your way to church this morning, you looked over at the person you were riding with and you said, I sure hope... Pastor Lou talks about wrath today, you know? Now, you're welcome for that, for those of you that might have asked. But I want to show us that, yes, it is true that God is love, but it is because, but it is because he is love, not in spite of his attribute of love, that he hates sin, and he expresses a wrathful anger toward it, okay? That's what we're going to talk about today. Let me, let me just bring everybody up to speed quickly. The word atonement, at one meant, has to do with harmony. It has to do with a reconciled relationship where there was one separation. The Bible is clear that when Adam sinned, the whole human family fell and was affected by that. And therefore, all of us are sinners by nature and by choice. And the very nature of sin is that it separates us. We say that sin is not just breaking the commands of God, but making good things into ultimate things. Sin at its root is idolatry. But in God's love and in God's mercy toward us, he initiated a way for us to enter into, or should I say, re-enter into this relationship with him. That's what the cross is all about. We've looked at several Old Testament passages of the Old Testament concerning the sacrificial system that God gave to Israel as a way, as a means to approach him. And let me again just Humor me and and take in this one verse that I keep saying over and over in the Old Testament. Remembering that the sacrificial animals, the blood that was shed, was a way to show us how great and grievous and despicable our sins are before God. Leviticus 17, 11, if you don't know it already, says this about the sacrifice. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls reconciliation for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life so God not only initiates this system but he tells us why he said that blood was given to make atonement that life of the creature is in the blood and in the shedding of it the ending of life life poured out in death it was symbolic way of saying that this should be me I should die my sins deserve death So we saw that the Bible teaches us that the blood of animals were not sufficient, that Jesus is, our first sermon, the true and the better sacrifice. All the Old Testament sacrificial system pointed to and was fulfilled in Jesus. He's the better sacrifice. Next we saw that Jesus was the true and the better substitute. He died the death we should have died. Jesus said, I've come not to serve, 
but to serve and to give my life a ransom for anti in the Greek. Anti meaning in substitute for many. I gave my life for a substitute for many. Isaiah said that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, in our place for our iniquities. Third, we saw that Jesus was the true and better redeemer and the Passover, that Jesus ultimately paid the debt we owe because of our sin. He ransomed us by his death. He paid the debt, set us free from the captivity of bondage and sin and Satan and the penalty of sin and, and the power of sin and soon the presence of sin in all eternity. Last week we saw that Jesus is the true and better reconciler. This is all about the perfect righteousness of Christ. He fulfilled the law perfectly. Justification has to do with righteousness. And when Jesus died, the great exchange took place. He died and bore the penalty for our sins. Our sins imputed to him. His righteousness imputed to us. It is what is called an alien righteousness. It's not something we do. It's been something that has been given to us by grace through faith. We'll look this morning at the topic, the final topic of Christ's reconciling work, his atoning work on the cross, expiation and propitiation. That's where we're at. We're going to see it in the four things. Number one, our sin must be punished. And that's not a, you know, a topic that we talk about a whole lot in our culture, but sin must be punished. Number two, our God, whoops, excuse me. Let me see if I can go back one more. Okay. God's wrath must be appeased. Sin must be punished. God's wrath must be appeased. Our filth must be cleansed. And finally, God's love has been revealed. Okay? That's where we're going. First, our sins must be punished. The Bible is clear that we are to take sin seriously. So much so that it requires the shedding of blood. We just can't assume... I hope you're not here just assuming, well, you know, God made us. God's our creator. He's, if he's out there, if there is a God, he's a God of love, and he's a good God, and he's a forgiving God, and that anyone could simply have forgiveness by any means in which they choose to seek forgiveness. That's not the biblical picture. That's not biblical Christianity. The Bible is clear, very clear, that sin has stopped. Sin has interrupted and has alienated us with our relationship with God. Very clear. Isaiah 59.1 Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your sin, your iniquities, have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. It's not like God's got earplugs in. But the relationship and what they're talking about has been severed and it's been broken. Okay? And therefore, sin is serious and must be dealt with. It can't be ignored. There's actually something in our way. There's something blocking us. There's something alienating us from God. Because God is righteous. God is holy. God is just. And he has to deal with sin. He must punish sin. And we see this clearly portrayed to us as God revealed himself to us. In, in the word of God, as the picture of God being our judge. God being our judge. Jeremiah 9, 24 says this. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and know me, that I am the Lord. I am the one who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And we see it all over the Bible that, that God is the judge, God will judge, and God is the ultimate judge. Psalm 711, God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. Psalm 50, verse 4 and 6, he calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Jesus said in John 5, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. For those who believe his word. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted in the Son also those who have life in himself. And he has given him authority, that's Jesus, to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. You know, it was God who judged Adam and Eve. 
It was God who judged who expelled them from the garden. It was God who judged and pronounced curse upon their future earthly life. It was God who judged the corrupt world in Noah's day and sent the flood to destroy all mankind. It was God who judged Sodom and Gomorrah, sending hot tar from the sky to destroy the city. It was God who judged, his name is Jesus in Matthew 21, who judged the Jewish people for rejecting their Messiah. God judged Ananias and Sapphira for lying in Acts 5. God judged Herod in Acts 12, and he was eaten by worms. God even judged in 1 Corinthians 11 Christians who were taking the Lord's Supper irreverently, and they got sick and ill, and some of them actually died. I want you to think through this with me, okay? I don't know where you are in your faith, some of you. If God, listen, if God declares himself to be righteous, perfect, and holy, how could he not judge wickedness and sin? What kind of world would we live in? What kind of culture, what kind of society would we live in if we do not judge wrongdoing? What kind of place would it be? What kind of culture would it be, what kind of world would it be if there was no retribution for wrong, for wrongdoing? I submit to you this morning that righteous judgment and retribution for wrongdoing is, is a moral law, an eternal moral law of all creation because of a personal creator who created it. It is the very nature of a judge's task to to. Do what is right. It is to repay evil for evil. It is to, to reward good. In our day, we must admit, it's not always done that way. There's corruption. I get that. But we long for the right thing to do. We long for wrongdoing to be punished and righteousness to be upheld. See, the character of God gives us the guarantee that every single wrong will be righted. Every single sin will be paid for will be punished. Someday, the Apostle Paul says, it is when the day of wrath comes, when God's righteousness judgment will be revealed. And at that point, it'll be exact. It'll be perfect. And there'll be no cosmic unfairness on the earth because God is judge. So justice will be done. Can you imagine, can you imagine an Albany County judge sitting on his bench? In comes a young man who has brutally hurt a child. And the judge, after hearing the case, after seeing the evidence, after even the admission of the guilty one, says, you know what? I'm going to show you love today. You could just go. You're free to go. Would he be a good judge or a bad judge? Would he be a just judge or an unjust judge? A righteous judge or an unrighteous judge? Here's one. Would he be a loving judge or an unloving judge? I submit he'd be unrighteous and unloving. Here's a question. What if God did not care? Just think. God does not care. He is indifferent against evil. He sees all the brutality of young children. He sees all the disintegration of, of the pain and the hurt that people cause on others. And he thinks, ah, such is life. Such is life. That moral indifference would not be praiseworthy, it would actually be and show itself as defective. Wouldn't you not agree? But God is good, righteous, and he's holy. So not to judge the world, but to show moral indifference would actually be a deficiency in God and therefore not worthy of our worship. Not worthy of our worship. Think of it this way. If God was sitting by watching someone get hurt, would it, would it draw us into praise? Glory, the majesty of God. What kind of God would he be? If we would demand justice from our judges, if we would demand justice from the Albany County judges, and would be outraged if if he did not judge properly, why would we expect anything different for the God who will judge the universe, who is perfect, righteous, and good? I don't think we can. Our sin must be punished. God is our judge. Secondly, God's wrath must be appeased. Now, before you just check out on me, hear me out. There are some who say that God cannot be wrathful because God is love. I want to challenge that. I want to push you this morning, and I want to say, I want to, I want to ask you to see that God's love and God's wrath coincide. 
Now, the wrath of God is talked about all throughout Scripture. Okay, so I'm going to assume right from the beginning that most of you are here this morning and you've been lied to and said God's not angry, God is not wrathful. At that point, you're saying God is indifferent against evil. And you know that to be not true. You've been told that God is only loving, God is only gracious, God is only forgiving. Actually, he's this giant fairy in the sky running a daycare service and handing out lollipops to all the good kids. That, that's, that's the kind of God we got in our mind. God's wrath, God pouring out of judgment, God's uh, uh, um, anger towards sin is mentioned over 600 times in the Bible. So we're going to go through each one. No. <laughs> Let me just give you one, okay? Just one. I only got one. Or maybe two. Nahum, prophet, chapter 1, verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and an avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. Wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. You say, well, okay, Pastor Lou, that, that's the Old Testament. That's the angry God, but we have a God who's taking some meds now. He's writing New Testament stuff. He's much chiller than that. Jesus, John chapter 3, verse 37, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And if you read your Bible, you'll notice that Jesus said a lot of things, a lot of inflammatory things, according to the religious Bible thumpers in that day. He says, your father is the devil. He says, you are twice the son of hell, right? Good way to make friends and influence people. <laughs> Jesus walks into the temple. He sees people getting robbed, extorted, and starts chucking tables, not plastic ones. Hard, big, wood Tables. It even says that Jesus was tossing the money changers' chairs. It is my belief that they were still on it. Okay, that's just what I believe. It doesn't say that in Scripture, but I believe he was chucking them too. Okay? Mark 3 verse 5 says, Jesus looked at them in anger and was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Jesus got angry. Jesus is not, as some would say, some hippie dude, flowers and, you know, sandals, singing campfire songs with his acoustic guitar. In fact, the Bible says that when he comes back, people will try and hide themselves in the caves among the rocks, calling on the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb of God. Wow. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. But because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, God's wrath is his unsettled, change, unchanging anger. The problem we have, okay, I, I, I want you to see it. Let me read that again. God's wrath, we're going to look at this in a minute. God's wrath is the settled, unchanging anger and displeasure opposing sin. His wrath is the response of his holiness toward wickedness and rebellion. And the problem that many of us face in trusting and believing the revealed will of God in Scripture is threefold. I think I have all three. Yes, okay, good. Number one, number one, people tend to, have a, uh, to ha equate human wrath with God's wrath, right? There's a tendency to equate human wrath with God's wrath. As I said, God's wrath is very different. God's not like us. It's not explosive. It's not irrational outbursts. It's not this hot-tempered explosion of emotions that we see many times in human experiences. It's always perfect. It's always just. It's unsettled. It's, excuse me. It's settled. It's unchanging anger. It displeases. It hates. It repels against sin. It is always just. It is always righteous. His wrath is a response to his holiness. It's totally pure, completely uncontaminated. But human anger many times is what? Arbitrary, it's malicious. Divine anger is always principled and divine anger is always controlled. John Stott says this about God's anger and wrath. John Stott. It is a continuous, settled antagonism aroused only by evil and expressed in its condemnation. 
God is entirely free from personal animosity or vindictiveness. Indeed, he is sustained simultaneously with undiminished love for the offender. End quote. Some of you are thinking, really? God's wrath towards sin is so fierce? Really? I, I, I don't sense that. I don't sense that. Why? Well, I don't feel like God's very angry with me. I'm doing whatever I want. I, I'm making money. I'm enjoying my sin. I'm living life apart from God. I'm sexual in, uh, impurities, living a dream, getting your degrees, and doing whatever you want with no thought of God. Family, listen, there is the active and there is the passive wrath of God. God's anger is both passive and God's anger is active. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is, I'll say it again, for the wrath of God is already revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. He tells us what that means. Verse 24. And what happens? What's the consequence? Verse 24. Because of that, because his wrath is being revealed, because God is, is, is wrath is continually being poured out against sin. Verse 24. So God gives them over to the lust of their hearts. Verse 26. God gave them over to the degrading passions of their hearts. Verse 28, chapter 1 of Romans I'm in. God gave them over to depraved minds. So we see the act of Wrath of God, Herod dies, believers are, are uh, Herod dies and, and all kinds of things are going on. But then we see this inactive, this passive wrath where God is saying, go. Do as you want. Think of a father who finally has to turn to his son. Or look of a father who takes his son and continually disciplines. There's hope. But think of a father who's gotten to the point who has to say, go, get out. I'm done. I'm done. You're going to do it anyway. You're going to do whatever you want. That child is at the greatest position for trouble and pending disaster. It is God's wrath who lets the person do whatever the hell they want to do. And I chose that word intentionally because when you do what you want, you do what hell wants. It's passive and active. And there's a tendency to see that it's not the settled anger towards sin. Number two, we fail to see that God both loves and is wrathful at the same time. The reason that we can't understand that God is both love and wrathful is because we don't understand that our anger, our, our wrath, even personally, is tied to and linked to the things that we love. To the things that we love. Love and wrathful is because they're linked together. Love and anger go together. That, that is why anger is not a bad thing all the time. Anger is a natural response to things that threaten us, to things that we love. As a result, aggression sometimes is appropriate in response to anger. You get angry, you want to defend yourself. You get angry, you want to step in and help somebody. When you ask the question, What's my, what, what am I angry about? What's it rooted in? Sometimes and many times it reveals to, to you the things that you care about that you love the most. It could be wrong, could be right. You may love that drink. You may love that drug and someone's trying to take it from you and you're getting angry. But you may love your child and protect that child as well. What if you saw someone abusing, even verbally abusing, their wife? That would upset me. That would upset you, I'm sure. But what if the person they're abusing, their wife they're abusing, is your daughter? It'd be a whole different story, wouldn't it? What if you saw a car driving down the road erratically and dri almost driving a car off the road and causing a, a severe accident. That would upset me. But what if I pulled up and I saw the passenger in that car was my son or my daughter? Anger defends that which it loves, that which it is threatened. The greater the anger, the greater the love. Actually, if you don't get angry on any human level, you're Vulcan. <laughs> okay, I mean, sin should get you angry. We should become angry like God when we see the weak exploited. We see uh, those we care about get injured. We see injustices being done. It's very legitimate. But God is said to be a jealous God in part because he hates sin. God's jealousy is good, not the stalking kind of jealousy, but the love, protect, guide, and care for kind of jealousy. Listen, God loves his creation very much. God loves his Like an artist who loves their painting God loves what he created, and he gets angry when his creation 
rebels against him when his creation is abused, when they're marred and defaced and devalued by others. That is why he is wrathful against evil, because he loves his creation. And when people hurt children, oppress the poor, God rightly becomes wrathful. Think about it. The third reason is failure to understand that God is holy. Have you ever heard the question, if God is loving, he won't punish me? That kind of question comes from a false understanding of God's holiness. Again, R.C. Sproul makes this insightful um, observation from Isaiah 6. He says, the Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Not that he is merely holy or even holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. Holy. The Bible never says that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does say that he is holy, 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 and the whole earth is full of his glory. We already covered God's holiness, but let me just remind you. The fountain of God's holiness, the foundation of God's holiness, is that he is separate from sin and evil and that he is perfectly pure. He's also separate from all that is common. So everything in this world, everything he's created is, is infinitely less valuable than his infinite, incalculable worth, glory, weightiness. Holiness speaks of his majesty, his preeminence, his moral excellence and purity of his character. He is sinless, separate, perfect, other, and good. All that he does is good. All that he does is right. And all that he does is without sin. The problem is, sinful people and a holy God like that does not make for warm relationships. And God wants to have a relationship with us. And that's a problem for him. Sometimes we're so steep in our sin, we don't even realize it. Okay? It is only when we get that glimpse of his holiness, like Isaiah who saw it, who said, woe is me, I am ruined from a man of unclean lips. Do you know that God prohibited Moses to enter into the promised land? He, he, he delivered the people, he got all the way up to the promised land, but he was prohibited to go in. Moses never saw, but he came close, but he never saw the promised land. He never went into the promised land. Why? God told them, because you did not believe me. To uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the assembly into the land that I have given them. And by dealing severely with Moses for his sin, God is said to, be, to have proven himself holy among his people. So in a moment of anger, in a moment of sin, Moses, you know the story, breaks the rock in disobedience, and God says, that is it. I'm holy. I will show the Israelites that I am perfect and you must follow my command. God is holy and because he's holy, he cannot, brace, he cannot embrace sin. He must administer justice. And in order for salvation to be offered, in order for salvation to be received, God's wrath must be dealt with. It must be appeased. It must be dealt with. God cannot look over sin. He cannot look over sin because he is holy. God cannot simply forgive sin because he's righteous and he's a just judge. You know that to be true in our own experience. There must be reparation in order for a holy God to embrace sinful human beings. God's righteousness, listen, demands it. If he does not punish sin, think of this, he would not be righteous judge. And there would be no ultimate justice in the universe. We would disintegrate. But when sin is punished, God is showing himself to be righteous, to be just, to be a good God, a good judge, and overall justice then will be done. His anger, his wrath towards sin is a reality that each of us must not only consider, but have it placated, have it appeased. Something has to be done so that God upholds his justice, shows himself as a good, right, just God, and what about the outpouring of wrath on sin and judgment? In order, that has to be dealt with in order to reconcile us to him. And we see over and over in scriptures that the holiness of God, his purity, his excellence, his moral purity, his excellence, cannot coexist with sin. It exposes sin. And wrath opposes sin. Understand that today. Third, our filth must be cleansed. We talked a lot about sin in the past 
Sin is not only breaking the commands of God, it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's breaking the first commandment, having no other God before you. It means making good things ultimate things and worshiping false things as bad things. Good things we could worship as our job, our kids. They become the ultimate thing. We worship creation rather than creator. Bad things could be like drugs and, 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 and sexual immorality and, and alcohol. They become our worship. And what we do is we are caught up and we are enslaved to that in which we worship. We also said that sin separates, but what I want to see today is that sin not only separates us, but that sin defiles a person. There are several ways in Scripture this can be spoken about. When the psalmist was talking about the idolatry and the sin and the rebellion of Israel, Psalm 106, it says this, they become defiled by their acts and play the whore in their deeds. There's defilement in sin. Proverbs 30, verse 11. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. Those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed from their filth. There's defilement, there's filth. Mark 7, 20. It is not what goes into your heart, Jesus says, but what comes out of your heart that makes you unclean. So the Bible talks about sin not only separates us, but it's, it's filth, it's uncleanness, it's defilement, it's a staining of the soul. So let me get a little personal, if I may. I say this because I love you, I've spoken to you, I, ha I have tried to teach the Bible in all its entirety, and, and I want you to hear me out. Some of us, and that include me, have sinned and have felt the shame and the dirt of it all. We felt dirty, we felt unclean. Many times this sense of uncleanness has to do with sexual impurity. Sin not only separates, but a sin stains us. So much so that when you hear people who have, been, who have been sexually impure, who have had sins against them, they'll say things like, I feel dirty, I feel gross, I feel like I want to shower, I feel like I want to be cleansed. I feel defiled. I feel dirty, I feel filthy. It's not just a physical thing, that's what this culture will tell you. Sexual impurity has to do with your soul. It's not just physical, it's a soul staining that's going on. It's not only what you have done, but what have the others done to you. When we study Genesis in chapter, when we study Genesis, we got to chapter 34, we study how Jacob was told that his daughter Dinah was defiled. She was raped. She by no sin of her own was violated and the Bible says defiled. It's an, case, it, you know, it's an act of violence against both body and soul. Now I know women are more prone to it, but there have been men sexually perverted or have been sexually violated that feel dirty, that feel defiled, that feel defiled. The Bible also says that it's through incest that defilement comes. It's through adultery, that's having sex outside your covenantal marriage. Or fornication, that's not being in marriage and having sex. And prostitution, the exchange of goods for sex. And let me remind you in our culture in that day, maybe in the room this side, Size. Prostitution is not just a street girl corner down in Albany flipping tricks. The stupid culture that we have today is I took you out four times, I bought you popcorn and took you to dinner, you owe me. That's prostitution. Ladies, that's prostitution. If you feel that pressure, you think that's what's going on, run. Run. That's prostitution. It's defiling, it's degrading, it stains the soul. Some of us had bad things happen to us. Some of you had bad things happen to you that were degrading and defiling. And in the Old Testament, God makes it clear and very, very clear that undefilement, uncleanness, defilement, dirtiness, filthiness will not be allowed into his presence. That sin won't be allowed. Numbers chapter 5. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people, get ready to go into the promised land, command the people of Israel that they, they were to put out of the camp everyone who has leprosy or discharge, anyone who's unclean, through the contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp, and they may not be defiled. They may not defile their camp. Put them out. Don't want to defile them. In the midst of which I dwell, he says. And the people of Israel did so and put them outside the camp, just as God had told them. The laws of cleanness and defilement you'll find in Leviticus chapter 15. It was great this week. Ricky and I went to a pastor's conference and Pastor Ligon Duncan of Mississippi uh, talked about the, the, the ceremonial laws. It just reminded me and, and, and just 
drove home the reality that these laws were given not only for practical purposes because there was no antibiotics in those days and somebody who was defiled, the spreading of disease could be so paramount and so devastating that you would actually quarantine them. It was actually a mercy thing. It wasn't just, you know, honey or, or uh, your brother, your mother, your father had to be removed from the camp in isolation. It was, it was, to, it was uh, you know, to save the rest of the people from getting those kind of diseases without antibiotics, as I said. But it's also a spiritual thing. Defilement and dirtiness pointed to the fact that it's sin. Defilement is sin. And the fact that God is holy and that um, God was laying out in his laws that he's not going to dwell where there's uncleanness. You see what he says? Where they dwell. I'm not going to be there in the midst of them. I will not be with them. I will not dwell with them where there's uncleanness, where there is sin, where there is defilement. Sin is not only breaking the law, but rebelling against God, but it's also moral defilement. God is saying in the most clear and precise way, I'm holy, I'm not going to dwell with their sin. In fact, Revelation 21, and the end of time with the new heavens and a new earth, it says that nothing unclean will enter into the new heavens and a new earth, nor anyone who does what is detestable and false, but only those who's written in the Lamb book of life. Finally, God's love has been revealed. God's love and everything we've spoken about has been clearly manifested through the expiation and propitiation of Jesus' atonement. Now listen carefully. Work with me. Track with me a few more minutes. Let me just define some terms for you. Number one, expiation has to do with removing something or taking something away. Expiation to remove and to take something away. In the scripture, it has to do with taking away our guilt through an offering, through the payment of a penalty. It's the removing, it's the covering, it's the, it's the sending off of our sin. It's associated with the cleansing work of the sacrifice. Propitiation has to do with the object of the expiation, it, okay? The object, propitiation, brings about a change in God's attitude so that he moves from being that enmity and that wrath to being with us and for us. It is through the process of propitiation that he restores relationship and has grace toward us. So propitiation means the appeasing, the turning away of anger, it's personal expiation, is the making amends, it's the covering of our sin. Now, Leon Morris, in his book on the atonement, a great book, said this. Propitiation is a personal word. One propitiates a person. Expiation is more of an impersonal word. One expiates a sin or a crime, end quote. God's personal wrath toward the personal sinner has to be appeased. Payment must be paid. And the blood that was shed covers and sends away our sin. Now, the greatest place to find that in the Bible, and, well, in the Old Testament, is the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And but We talked about this before a couple of weeks ago, but let me just remind you, on that day, the high priest would wash. He'd wash his body several times. He'd wash his hands, he'd wash his feet, cleansing going on before he could enter into the Holy of Holies in that center place where God would meet with Israel once a year. He'd wash. He would put on his Day of Atonement clothing that was separated from all the other days he would do his sacrificial work. He had a holy, separate, not common, white linen he would wear. Again, pointing to God's holy, God is separate, God is perfect. You have to cleanse. He would do first make a sacrifice, shed the blood for his own family and for his own sins. They would have to be without defect and blemish. Again, showing us that God is without blemish. God is clean. God is pure. One of the goats he would take on the Day of Atonement, he would shed the blood. It would be a sin offering. And the high priest would saw, slaughter this innocent animal. And it acted as a substitute for the sinner who rightly deserved a violent death. For their sins, he would take the blood of the animal, he'd go into the, the Holy of Holies, the place where the Shekinah glory would, would dwell, and he would pour blood over the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, where the law was. God looked down and saw the law, knew that Israel had broken the law, violated the law, became blemished, became unclean, became defiled because of their sin, and the blood interposed between the righteous God who must judge sin, we already covered that, and the law that was broken. 
In between was the covering, became the place of propitiation. God's wrath was appeased. God would come and see the blood and would deal graciously with Israel for the following year. And on that basis, God would deal kindly toward them. The goat was no longer considered innocent. It took on the guilt of the offerer and of the people, and its blood represented life as a payment for sin. What's cool is that there was a second goat. And the second goat would call the scapegoat. And, and they would confess their sins on this goat, and the goat would be sent out into the wilderness, showing the covering, the sending out, the removal, the expiating of sin. The priest would lay on his hands on the goat. The goat's perfection without blemish would become the Israelites and the high priest. Unperfections would become perfections, and there would be a transfer going on. The unblemished goat, would take on our sin. The blemished people would take on the unblemished goats. It was a symbol of an exchange that was going on. And what was happening on that day of uh, of atonement was both appropriation, propitiation, dealing with God's wrath and anger, and the sending away, the covering of our sins. Now watch this. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. There's no distinction All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified, made right by grace as a gift through the redemption, we looked at that, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by Jesus' blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. He's the right and good and just judge because in his forbearance he passed over formal sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Put your finger in that text and turn to Romans 5. For while we were still weak, the right time, Jesus died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps maybe for a good person one would dare to die. But God, verse 8, showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, go on. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by Jesus from the wrath of God. First notice, it wasn't us. God takes initiative. We're still sinners. It wasn't like our hearts were like, all right, we're going we're gonna, to, all right, I'll, I'm going to soften my heart toward God. No. We were sinful, we were rebellious, we were unclean, we were blemished, and God makes the initiative. He comes and wants to reconcile us to himself. How? By the death of Christ. Because the wrath of God, verse chapter 3, was poured out on Jesus. He is our propitiation. If you have an RSV version, if you don't know what that is and you don't have one, the word, the word propitiation in chapter 3 and all of actually Romans 12 times wrath is mentioned in Romans. If you have that, the word propitiation was taken out and the word expiation was put in. They're wrong. In fact, in the 1950s when the RSV was made, many Bible-believing Christians burned their Bibles because there was a liberal agenda trying to take away and try to obscure the reality over 600 times that God is wrathful towards sin. Now, expiation and propitiation are taught in the Bible, but Romans 3 and 5 Clearly, Paul is talking about the wrath-absorbing sacrifice of Christ. Listen to what he says up to chapter 5. Romans 1, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Romans 2, because the hardness of hearts, you're storing up wrath for yourself. Romans 2 again, but those who are self-seeking don't obey the truth. Obey only unrighteous, there'll be wrath and fury. Romans 3. But if our righteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? One more, Romans 4. Twelve times this goes on. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Paul understands that if Christ did not come to pay the penalty for our sins, God would be shown and be seen as unjust. That's why he's the just and the justifier. When God sent Jesus to die as the penalty for our sin, God stored up wrath for eternity for all our sins, all human sins, was poured out on Jesus while he was punished for our sins, unleashing his wrath against sin to uphold his justice on Jesus Christ, his own son, 
That's why Jesus is, God is the just. Punishment was paid, wrath appeased, and the justifier for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Paul is precise in declaring that Jesus took the full fury of the wrath of God for our sins. He reconciles, he redeems us. Wayne Grudem says this, Therefore in the cross we have a clear demonstration of the reason God punishes sin. If he did not punish sin, he would not be a righteous God. There would be no ultimate justice in the universe. But when he does punish, God is showing himself to be a righteous God. So unless propitiation in Romans means the adverting, the, the poured out wrath of God on Jesus, Paul says you are all under wrath 12 times and leaves us standing there under it. But that's not the case. The word is propitiation. It means that in Jesus Christ, his death on the cross was our wrath-absorbing sacrifice. Now listen, God does not change. He's unchanging, the Bible says. So God's not one minute wrathful and one minute loving. It's not that God's wrath turned into love. That's not true. And this is not this God who is capricious. He is demanding no one understands god made it clear to everyone what sin is what unblemishes, is what uncleanness is what righteousness what holiness is and what perfection is we just can't live it god's wrath is god's love blazing out in fury indignation against evil evil roger nicole we're almost done track with me roger nicole did a great job on propitiation this is what he wrote now listen the notion that wrath is thereby turned into love and mercy. This is what he's talking about. How often is it going to be necessary to emphasize in reply to such criticism that the propitiation effected in the expiatory work of Christ is the provision of God's invincible love. Yes, even our Father's love, so that the love of God may achieve its purpose in a way that is entirely constant with and to the vindication of the dictates of divine holiness. Truly God is love, but he loves himself supremely, and the love of himself requires that the interest of his love to lost men be realized in a way that is consistent with the love of himself. He writes, propitiation does not detract from the love and mercy of God. It rather enhances the marvel of that love. In a word, it shows the extent to which God's love goes in order to achieve its redemptive end. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? So try to wrap your head around this. Jesus Christ on the cross, Jesus Christ on the cross, in total darkness surrounding Calvary, judgment showed up, and God pours out his justice, his wrath, on Jesus, and then Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is not the ultimate and final abandonment, but for the moment, while Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. He bore the guilt of our sins, and in that moment, he faced the deep and furious wrath of the infinite God. And for a season, he felt and he endured the most profound suffering of God's anger towards sin for you. And for me, God forsook the sin bearer because of his holiness and the rod of wrath was poured out on him and that brought him to that cry. In a moment, which we will never totally understand, in that moment, Jesus was forsaken by the Father as he drank the cup of his wrath so that we might have forgiveness of sins through his suffering. Propitiation is simply this, justice will be served, justice will be done, sin has been committed, and Jesus takes that wrath, the deserving punishment upon himself. His righteousness is given to us, our sins have been imputed to him, and then he stands in our place taking our wrath on himself, and what we legally are becomes his, and then he dies in our place. He dies in our place. And here's the truth. We will all stand before Jesus Christ. If we don't belong to him, uh, uh, God's hatred of sin and his wrath will be poured out on the sinner forever. God's an eternal God. Sins against an eternal God requires an eternal punishment. And Jesus is either your eternal God who paid your debt or you will pay it eternally yourself. I implore you, think. Trust Christ. And listen, last thing. If that's not enough, I mean, you say, awesome. But if that's not enough, 
The gospel according to Mark chapter 5 says that Jesus in his ministry raised a young girl to life who was dead by touching her body. He heals a woman who had a blood disorder for 12 years as she reached out and touched his garments. Every law, everything in Jerusalem, everything in the Israelites would then at that moment declare Jesus unclean. You can't touch a dead body. You can't touch a woman with defilement. You will be unclean. You will be abandoned, abandoned from the people in the dwelling of God. He should be expelled. God does not dwell in the midst of uncleanness. And for all religious purposes, Jesus is now defiled. And up to that point in all of history, everything that was clean that touched something unclean became unclean. And now for the first time, divine holiness is not defiled by touching human uncleanness, but rather in parts cleansing. Jesus saying, I am cleanness. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what others have done, how bad it is, or what has been going on in your life, no matter how inadequate, how shameful you feel, no matter what. Jesus saying, if you come into relationship with me through the cross, you're clean. You're clean. Shame, cleanliness has been restored. Un- unshamefulness. Being unshamed, dealing with your shame. Your uncleanness has been dealt with. No more defilement, no more sin, no more filth, no more dirty, no more defilement. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and what? Cleanse us. Washed, pure, spotless, no blemishes when you come in contact with the clean with the vine holiness of Jesus Christ. Here's the good news. Filth and sin washed away. We can be clean. You no longer have to live out of the old identity of defilement and cleanness. No matter what has happened to you or the things that you have done, you have a new identity. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old is gone. Everything becomes new. Satan wants to lie to you and tell you you'll never get rid of that dirt. You'll never get rid of that defilement. You'll never get rid of that filthiness. Jesus says you are clean. You are washed. You have become as clean as I am. Can't get any more clean than that. Don't believe Satan's lies. Christ said in him, you are clean. He took your defilement and felt on himself when he died. His blood washes us. His work on the cross becomes, he becomes the just and the justifier. The atonement is so important. Not only in your own life as you live and walk with Jesus Christ. Appropriating the truth to your life. Walking in the gospel. Especially in our day and time. As the band comes up, I will explain to you that this this bread that's here is Jesus' body that was broken. It was the wrath that was poured out on him on the cross. That's what that bread represents. Jesus' propitiatory sacrifice taking the just penalty that's due our sin. The cup is the blood that was shed to wash away your sins. The Lord's Supper is about the body that was broken, the wrath that was taken, the blood that was shed, the cleansing of our sins. Do you know Jesus Christ? If you don't know him, come to him. Come to him. Confess your sins. Confess you've been walking in lies. Even if, it's, even if it's things that have been done to you that's been holding you down, you confess it, you've been clean, you walk in that truth. Jesus washes you from your sin. Jesus cleanses you from your sins. But if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ. The Bible says, Jesus said, the wrath of God remains on you. I implore you, I beg you, by the power of the Spirit, turn from your sins. Trust in Jesus who died for your sins. Trust in Jesus who took the wrath for you and your sins, and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. The band's going to play. We're going to put a curtain around our heart. We're going to confess our sins. We're going to repent of our sins, maybe the first time ever. And then we're going to celebrate the work of Jesus, his cleansing power, his wrathful obedience, his wrathful taking of our sins upon himself. And then we'll come and we'll gather and have communion together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the sacrifice Lord Jesus, that you accomplished for us on the cross. All our sin, all our folly, all our shame, all our brokenness, all our blemishes, all our uncleanness, all our filth, all our defilement has been given 
to you as you absorb the Father's anger and wrath righteously towards sin. We confess we need you. We love you. We confess we take cover under the blood of the Lamb. And Father, I want to pray particularly for those who are on the fence, who are not sure that today will be the day they will run from the wrath and take cover under the blood, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Work in our heart, Father, that we may glorify you and worship you in spirit and truth. And we pray all this in Jesus' good name. Amen.